Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. Today we've got some crazy stories and our first story of the day is from life according to me 83. You can give a dollar off if it helps you make a sale. Back in the early 2000s, I was a college student working at Blockbuster. At that time it cost $3.70 to rent a movie, sometimes for just two nights. And the late fees were insane, as most who were adults at the time remember. We had this barcode on the side of the register we could scan to give a dollar off a movie rental, but only when it helped us make an additional sale. The idea was to help push the overpriced candy and give a dollar off a movie rental, so Blockbuster started a fundraiser for St. Jude's. No incentive at all for employees to get donations, but of course it was for a good cause I wanted to ask everyone. I got annoyed because people would spend a ton of money on late fees and more movie rentals and crap they didn't need but I asked everyone on a Saturday night in the busiest blockbuster in the entire state to donate and got two people out of several hundred to donate a dollar. The next day, I realized I had to scan a piece of paper so the dollar donation would ring up. Hence, the donation was technically an additional sale. So I started a new campaign of my own. Anyone who agreed to donate a dollar to charity got a dollar off their movie rental. For the next three weeks until the charity partnership was over, with the customer's permission, I took $1 off the movie rental each time and scanned the barcode for the $1 additional sale that went right to charity. The customers were happy because they could pay the same price and help a good cause, and I got to help collect a few thousand dollars for that cause, putting Blockbuster's own upselling methods to work against them. Honestly, what OP did here was super smart. And let's be honest, if you're working a job like that and you can give a dollar off to anybody, you know, to help make a sale, would you be handing that out left and right just to cut some people some slack? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is from Filigree's Daddy, Leave Management. Have I mentioned how much I hate shore postings? For those that haven't seen my previous malicious compliance, I'll create a brief background. During my time in the Navy, I was posted to a shore-based workshop with more people than it needed. Micromanagement ensues. So on this given day in the workshop, at our morning muster, the chief announces, anyone with more than 30 days annual leave needs to start taking leave to get their leave balance down. Me with 75 days at this time said, why? The chief said, it's a directive from the chief of Navy. So me being me, I go look up the books, specifically the pay and conditions manual, Pac-Man. Fast forward three days, I get called in the chief's office. They say, why haven't you put leave in? I say, I don't want to. They say, didn't you hear me say it was a directive from the chief of Navy? I say, yes, but that directive isn't lawful. The chief, his blood pressure visibly rising said, what the freak do you mean? I say, in accordance with Pac-Man, I quoted the specific reference, I cannot be compelled to take annual leave. The chief said, get out. To be honest, by this stage, I was just seeing how many buttons I could push. In that workshop, we had to make our own entertainment. Two hours later, I was called up to my divisional officer. The conversation was more or less a carbon copy of the conversation I had with my chief, perhaps a bit less four-letter Anglo-Saxon verbiage. For the next week, I don't hear a peep. I know this isn't over. I've planned the next few things I can and will do, depending on how my chain of command proceeds. The next week, one of my petty officers, being from New Zealand originally, we naturally called him Kiwi, came back from leave. We'd worked together a few times and had a good rapport as a result. So of course, my chief sent him to try and thwart my evil plans. Petty officer said, OP, we need a chat. I said, hi Kiwi. They sending in the big guns to beat me down now, huh? They said, so you know what this is about? I say, yep. They say, you do realize they're talking about charging you. I say, what's the charge? They say, failure to comply with a lawful general order. I say, the order isn't lawful. The charge wouldn't stick. Even if it did, what would that punishment be? Stoppage of leave? They say, you're just doing this to cause problems, aren't you? I say, no, I genuinely don't want to take leave. I can't really afford to go anywhere, so I would just be spending a week sitting on my butt bored to crap. I can do that here and not lose any of my accrued leave. They say, okay, you don't have to take all of your leave at once, just start taking some. It'll take the heat off the entire chain of command, and those above might be less inclined to launch you into space without the benefit of a spacesuit. I say, okay, Kiwi, I'll think about it. I had actually thought about it. 
When posted ashore, we accrue approximately 0.8 days of annual leave per fortnight, which works out to be a bit over 1.6 days a month. So a few days later, I put in a leave request through the online system for the first Monday of the next month. And Monday, so A, it looks like I'm taking three days, but I'm only taking one, and B, so I couldn't get rostered for duty on that weekend. Leave approved? I enjoy my three-day weekend. The next month, same thing. The sharper ones in the crowd see what's happening. My leave balance is still going up, not down, just slower than it was before. After about three months, I get asked why I'm not putting anything in the reason for leave section of the online form. I point to the line on the form that says quite clearly that reasons don't need to be provided for annual leave requests. Please just put something in that space. So the next month, reason for leave, mental health day. Two months of that, then please don't put that in. So the next month, reason for leave, they're making me do this, I don't want to. That made them angry. The ear blistering I got for that one is definitely not PG, but the point was made on both sides. From then on, my one day off a month was leave management. They were so happy when I got a C posting later that year. I still wonder if they ever realized that I wasn't actually getting my leave balance down. What did I do with my Mondays off work? Day drinking. I actually found a venue near the biggest markets in the state that has lingerie waitresses from 9am to noon on Mondays, plus a few other places that had similar service over lunch and the early afternoon. Good times. OP really made a time of it. The times they finally were like, okay fine I'll take one day a month off. They really went off and tried to celebrate that day apparently. I would just love to know the people above him what they would think finding out that OP's mental health day was actually day drinking at these venues with lingerie waitresses from 9am to noon. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Every video has awesome stories, like our next story from Lungbong, automated my useless boss out of her job. This happened a few years ago. I was a data and reporting analyst and did all the ad hoc reports for the company. My boss, we'll call her Carrie, was useless. She was one of these people that was always late, left early, and took days off at short notice. The only thing of value she did was all the regular reports, sales, revenue, etc. We suspected she got away with it because she was having an affair with her boss, we'll call him Stuart. Our CEO was a fairly decent bloke. He'd look for ways to cut costs and would pay regular bonuses for the best cost-saving initiatives. Carrie was very keen to submit ideas and encouraged us all to automate our tasks so she could try and take credit for the savings. On one of her skeeve days, which coincidentally Stuart was sick as well, the CEO was desperate for the sales report my boss does. I said I'd give it a look and see if I could get it done. Normally she'd spend two to three days doing it each week, but the CEO wanted it that afternoon. A quick inspection of the data showed it would be quite easily automated, so I knocked up the necessary script and got it over to the CEO who was super impressed that not only had I gotten it done in a couple of hours, but also that it could be updated whenever he needed it. He asked if I could also look at the revenue, churn and a couple of other reports. Over that afternoon, I automated everything my boss did. Both Carrie and Stuart were back in the next day, but were immediately summoned to the CEO's office before being suspended and sent home. Turns out the CEO knew they were having an affair, and all the times they were sick or late or had to leave early was so they could sneak off and hook up. He'd not done anything about it because of how important these reports were. Now they were automated. He was able to get them suspended and later fired for gross misconduct for all the time they had taken off. I also got a nice bonus out of it. I mean, this is a situation where those people were risking their entire jobs to go and play hooky, right? And OP was just trying to do their job, stepped in and filled the role that they were just blatantly ignoring and frankly they were gone and doing such a poor job with their times because of their hooky playing that essentially in a roundabout way they got replaced and were let go. Our next story is from Yuna CH. Super Extra Spicy Fried Chicken I used to work for a big local fast food chain in the Philippines called Jollibee. I worked as a dining crew there and my job was to serve the customers. I was just fresh out of high school back then, around 2016. 
our store operated from 6 a.m. to 12 midnight, and one day, right when we were about to close down for the day, a woman in her mid-twenties came in with another girl. This woman was a bit tomboyish, and just looking at the way she moves, I can tell she was a hot shot. After she got her order, she and the girl she was with sat at the seat at the most isolated corner of the dining area. After a few minutes, her order came out and I served it to them. It was one spicy chicken and one classic chicken, both with rice and drinks. Just a bit of context, our spicy chicken is actually just your regular chicken, sprinkled with a very hot chili powder. The tomboy, who clearly is the one who ordered the spicy chicken for herself, took a look at the chicken, and in the most alpha male energy she could muster to impress the girl, she asked me to return the chicken to the kitchen and make it spicier. I just wanted things to be done so I can get back to cleaning, so I just took the chicken back to the kitchen and asked the fryman to add more spicy sprinkle to it. The PC, the one in control of the whole kitchen, interrupted and offered to make the chicken spicier instead. Apparently when the tomboy made their order earlier, they were very rude to the cashier, which pissed off the PC because the tomboy acted really arrogantly. I guess this is where you cue malicious compliance. The PC got a plate put on some plastic hand gloves, placed the chicken on the new plate, and poured all of the contents of the shake can on the chicken. The chili sprinkle on the shake can was going to be disposed of after the shift ended anyways, so the manager who was watching everything didn't really say anything. The PC then proceeded to roll the chicken around on the bed of spicy sprinkle, and by the time he was finished, the chicken that entered the kitchen with a golden brown color was now reddish. It just looks like a lump of chili sprinkles. I brought the order back to the tomboy and her girl and left them be and went out to clean the glass panels. It was near closing time, so I was in a hurry to do my cleaning. After about almost half an hour, I saw the tomboy left. She was beat red, as if she had had a fight with someone. There was no commotion, so I doubted that was actually the case. I went back inside to collect the dishes. When I got to their seat, I ended up laughing when I saw the tomboy's plate. On it was the breading of the chicken, some chewed up chicken that was spat back onto the plate, and a ton of chili sprinkles around the table. She clearly tried to shake off the excess chili powder, but wasn't too successful in doing so. The chicken was also only half eaten. I mean, I guess good on them for trying to impress somebody, but I don't really see how like eating super spicy food is supposed to be like something so impressive that somebody would like swoon over it. And certainly if you want anything to lead somewhere with this lady, I'm not assuming what they were up to, but if you did, you probably wouldn't want to be eating super spicy food, right? Just saying. And our final story of the day is from Far Ant Eater 256, a religious reading. Many years ago, I, then 29-year-old female, was the legal guardian for my brother's kids. Then 5-year-old female, and then 3-year-old male, we'll call them Jane and Max, while he finished a tour in Iraq. Not getting into the circumstances, it's enough to say the kids were in a pretty traumatized state and it was my job to make them as okay as possible while all the legal crap involving their mother was making its way through the courts. Their mother was permitted some supervised contact and she could give them gifts. I should also mention that their mother is a Christian, in name at least, this has little bearing on the story. I wasn't a parent myself yet but this was pretty straightforward to me. Make sure they feel loved, give them a sense of security give them normal routines, etc. All in all, things were as okay as they could be, given the circumstances. One of the normal routines I implemented was the reading of bedtime stories after baths and toothbrushing, which had never been a thing in their lives. They absolutely loved it and I was scrupulously fair about it. One day, Jane's story was read first and Max's was read second. The next day, Max's story was read first and Jane's was read second, etc. One day, sister-in-law gave the kids little Christian books, which went on their bookshelf with everything else. A week or so later, bedtime rolls around, Max picks whatever book, and Jane picks the Christian book her mother gave her. Now it should be said that Jane knows I'm agnostic. We've talked about it several times before, when she was trying to convince me to attend some church event, or other that grandma, my mom, took her to at her request. I don't care what other people believe, it's not my business, but I'm not that person and I will not waver from that stance. Of course, Jane's only five, so I never crushed her the way I would an adult who tried to convert me, but it's been made very plain over the months, and as she chooses this particular book, Jane's got a smirk on her face, 
proclaiming as loud as a bullhorn that she thinks she's got her auntie trapped now. I will have to read some Christian literature. It's Max's turn to have his book read first today, so we go through it with all the appropriate sound effects and character voices. I'm a very animated narrator. Next is Jane's book, which she hands to me with the sweetest smile and that little gotcha glint in her eyes. You sure this is the book you want, I ask? Oh yes, auntie. All right. I opened this little Christian book, smiled sweetly back, and proceeded to read that book. Oh lord, in the most dramatic preacher voice I can summon. In the name of Jesus, amen. Think Kenneth Copeland, with all the accompanying shoutiness and theatrical pauses. I could barely keep a straight face, and Max didn't even bother trying. He was laughing so hard he almost peed himself. After the heavily dramatized reading, I closed the book and handed it back with a smile. Jane gave me a hug, which I wholeheartedly returned and said, I'm sorry, auntie. I won't ask you to read Jesus books anymore. Honestly, it was a really cute story, and considering the maybe potentially touchy subject here, it actually turned out really nicely, and I think it just speaks to how good of a guardian OP is and how good they are with kids. But with that said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another malicious compliance story that was even more insane than the ones in this video, click on that left video. Or, if you missed my latest video, click on the right. But with that said, I'll see you all next time for some more stories.